Get me that signal. We need more power. So, what is the writing process like? I, I mean, we, we've heard about how voice actors work and how directors, but, but I haven't ever heard about how script writing works in the anime world. And... Uh, well, the way I explain it to uh, a lot of people is that it's like doing puzzles all day long. Because, you know, obviously it's already animated, so the flaps are animated. Um, and the syntax of Japanese is so different from English. Um, so. What happens is I get a bunch of files to my Dropbox, um, or I get a literal translation, I get video, um, I get character descriptions, um, and what I do is I, I watch the episode first, uh, subbed, and then I go through and watch it in chunks, like 10 seconds at a time, and basically I, so I watch it first, look at the translation, and then I approximate what I think it should be, and then I watch it again, and I say the line um, at a normal, natural pace. Like, I act it as well. Um, and then if it doesn't fit, I go in and I rewrite it, and I do that over and over again until I'm satisfied. And then um, at the end, once I've done that for the whole episode, then I'll go back and check it, uh, where I just watch the whole thing with the script up, and I say all the lines, you know, and I have to go, because a lot of it's overlapping and stuff like that. Um, and then I just make sure everything fits and works with the flaps. And, um, you know, depending on the show, I'll do, I have to stop and do research often. Like, I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about. And so I'll Google it and, um, you know, just try to acclimate my brain a little bit better to what's going on. So that's it in a nutshell. So does it take forever, though? Yes. It seems like it would be It does long take forever. Process. And I've been doing it for about um, two years, a little over two years now. Um, yeah, I started doing it in... Um, the spring of 2015. So um, when I first started, it would take me about an hour per minute. Um, so, you know, it's like a full week of work, 24, depending on the length of the show, typically it's about 24 minutes. Um, so yeah, like 20, 20 to 24 hours to write an episode. But now I've, you know, my brain has sort of like adjusted. And now, you know, it takes me anywhere from like, depending on how much on-screen talking there is and, you know, um, the nature of it. Um, it takes between eight to 12 hours to write a single episode. So do you have deadlines and, yes. and you have to like, you have three o'clock in the morning, I'm like, oh, <laughs> yes. 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 It depends on the nature of the dub. If it's a, a simul dub, then um, the deadlines are different. Um, it's weekly. Um, and then if it's a video title, then the deadlines are a little bit more flexible. Um, but yes, I have been, you know, I, I lived in New York for a little while, and when I first moved there, I, I started writing again. Um, took a little break and then started back up. And I didn't have Wi-Fi set up in my apartment yet. It's actually, you know, a lot of apartments in New York don't have Wi-Fi capability, so there was a, a Starbucks on the corner, and I remember one night, it being like 1 o'clock in the morning, you know, it's due by Monday, 9 a.m., um, Central Time, and I'm like sitting on the stoop of Starbucks, like uploading my files. Like, oh gosh, gotta get done. Uh, and you know, it's funny. Like a few weeks later, I was walking around in New York uh, at late at night. I got out with some friends, and I saw a guy doing the exact same thing <laughs> at a different Starbucks, but same model. So um, yes, but I love it. It's really fun. Um, it was really tedious and stressful at first, like just exhausting. You know, like sitting in front of a computer and watching the same five seconds of anime over and over and over again. But now that I kind of have the hang of it. Um, I love it. It's really fun. It's like doing puzzles all day long. So. <laughs> what else? Have you had the opportunity to actually act, direct, and write in something like you do all three yet? Um, well, technically, when you direct, you usually do a lot of rewriting. And every show that I've directed, I've played at least one character in. So, um, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really fun. because. When I act in a show that I'm directing, it's just me and the engineer, and um, so we get to goof off and just have a great time. So yeah, um, and actually, I'm pretty sure that in every single anime I've directed, I've played at least one cat. Like, That's what it looks like. Yeah, I make really good cat noises. So like, um, and in Love Chinibio and Other Delusions, the cat's like a character. You know, it's not just some random cat. But um, <laughs> come here. Um, uh, my talk is uh, first of all, have you been to Asin before? 
This is my second time. I came in uh, 2014. Okay. Uh, and so tell me, uh, why do you, why, why'd you come back? I mean, what made you want to come here in the first place? Well, when I came last time, it was only the second convention I'd ever gone to. Um, the first one was very small. It was WasabiCon, and I loved that. It was super fun. And then I came here, and um, I was blown away, first of all, by the number of attendees, um, by how well run it is. Um, just the way that they treat the guests is phenomenal. Um, everything is super organized. Um, I always have all of the information that I need. I just feel really welcomed. And um, it's a very warm, positive environment. And um, I'm sensitive to things like that. So um, it's nice. I remember I went out with a friend who lived here at the time. And I came back, and it was like midnight or something. And I walked in, and there were just like people cosplaying all around me. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> like, so. Um, I just really, and I kind of got spoiled, you know. I was like, are all cons like this? And they're not. <laughs> um, you know, all the cons that I've been to have been great, but um, this one, I think, above and beyond is just... Have you done any stage acting lately? Lately, yes. Um, I just, let's see, we closed uh, April 30th. I just got back from doing a show, uh, a new play, called uh, I Carry Your Heart by Georgette Kelly, up in Ithaca, New York, at the Hanger Theater. Um, and it was incredible. It was a new play, and I was working with um, a friend of mine who has been my scene partner on stage, but he was directing it. And um, I was just working with an incredible team of people on a beautiful, I would say perfect play. It's very rare that I read a play or, or work on a play that is perfect. Um, all of them usually have some, you know, problems, but this one was, is, Perfect. And they're actually, um, they just opened, I think last night, it was a bi-coastal world premiere. So we did um, a premiere in Ithaca, and then um, they're doing one in LA as well. So um, two productions of the same play, kind of running simultaneously, sort of. But they were rehearsing while we were performing, and blah, blah, blah. So um, I Carry Your Heart by Georgia Kelly. I guarantee if you have an ear into the theater world, you're going to be hearing about this play. It's amazing. So, yes. <laughs> How do you juggle that between like stage play work and then with the ADR work? Considering like we just heard about how busy it is and like you have ten to ten days mixed with doing rehearsals. Like, well, when do you sleep? Uh, rarely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've been fortunate in that it's all kind of worked out. You know, like the nature of being a freelance actor is that it's a lot of times a feast or famine situation so a lot of times when I don't have a play I have a lot of writing and a lot of voice work um, and the good thing about voice work is you get paid like you know depending on the company you know you get paid after so it's like oh Christmas hey yeah. I did this big role um, and then you know you open an envelope and you totally forgot about it you know. um, but then it gets difficult when there are a lot of shows you know when directors are calling you when you're in, when I'm in rehearsal for a play, depending on the theater company, um, a lot of times I work noon to nine. So it's like, okay, well, you know, I've got two hours in the morning and then I, you know, come in and record for two hours and then go straight to rehearsal until nine o'clock. Um, usually I try to say, well, okay, I'm rehearsing these dates and we open at this time and then I'll have days free. And so, you know, like uh, when I recorded Dusk Maiden of Amnesia, I, had just opened A Few Good Men at the alley. I played the Demi Moore character. Um, so I was on stage pretty much the whole time. And um, so we, you know, we do tech weekend, which is like three, 10 or 12 hour days in a row. And then you open, you have previews and then you open. Um, and so I went straight from that into recording Dust Maiden and that was like 42 hours of recording. But I actually whittled it down because I would go home and I would, you know, notice where we stopped and then I would go and watch the sub so I could prepare so I would know what was coming and like if I saw like any funky flaps or anything there to be like you know um so we whittled it down I think I recorded the show in 18 or 20 hours um so yeah it's it's not an easy life but it's certainly a fun one and it's incredibly rewarding um, so when I am working on a play generally what I do uh, before rehearsals start is I read the play many many times a lot of people like to go into rehearsals off book which means completely memorized um, I like to memorize in rehearsal so I just read the play over and over again to get a sense of the arc of the story to get a sense of um, my part in that um, what my character what my character's function is and then um, 
And then when you go in and start rehearsals, there's a lot of repetition. So generally you sit down for the first two or three days and do what we call table work, which is where you go through each uh, scene beat by beat and read it over and over again, talk about what's happening, talk about what your character wants, what the obstacles are uh, for that character getting what they want. Um, and then, you know, you <coughs> do what's called putting it on its feet, and then I take all the tables away, and everyone, um, you get up scripts in hand, usually, and um, you just rehearse, you just, you know, try different things, and the director says, okay, we'll go here on this line, and, you know, um, and then that, you do that pretty much until tech, and then tech is all about, like, hold, and then, like, lights will focus, and uh, they'll work in sound cues, and work in all the technical elements. Um, and then you open. And then with preparing to do a voice role, it depends on the role and the company and the director. A lot of times, you know, if it's a relatively small role, uh, I won't have any idea what I'm doing before I go in. So it's kind of like you just go in and you do it. And um, you just have to get really good at, um, you know, part of the reason that I don't go into a play already memorized is that I've gotten really good at memorization by doing anime because I'll like, you know, grab like five lines at a time and then watch the screen and like, tailor my performance to, you know, the character's facial expression, you know, what I hear in the Japanese, and so, um, it's like night and day, completely different. Um, and I guess keeping it all straight, you know, um, if I'm playing a really intense role on stage, I have to do kind of like, when I get home, like a, a cool down or something like fold laundry or do something just to like shake it off because you can find it, it's hard sometimes to compartmentalize, like your body doesn't know the difference between like, you know, um, going through something really intense on stage and in real life. So, um, it gets really muddy sometimes. So it's kind of an obstacle transitioning between the two. Yeah, yeah, a bit. Um, and you know, same thing with anime, like recording dust making was really intense. Um, and I would have to kind of like go work out or do something to like clear the air before I went and did a few good men, which is totally different. Um, and it's hard on the voice too, you know. There's a lot of, a lot of screaming and when you <laughs> talk for two hours straight to a room of 800 people, it's like you gotta, you know, um, keep it healthy and be respectful of your voice, so. But you said you were listening to the Japanese when you're doing some of the mm -hmm. voice work. I've talked to a number of voice actors and I've gotten mixed in that. Some don't want to hear it because yeah. they don't want it to influence their inflections and the way they, they, they mm -hmm. interpret the, the, the dialogue. Is that something you've always done? Yes, I've always done that. Um, certain companies just do, they just have the Japanese playing. Um, and I find it actually helps me because I know that, like, I want to remain true to um, the intent of the original performance. And um, while my interpretation might be slightly different, um, I still, I don't want it to be, I don't want to take it completely out of context. Mm -hmm. and, when I, and sometimes, like, especially for Foley, um, for like vocal, you know, nonverbal reactions, I like to hear what the Japanese did, just so I can, you know, make sure I'm not like way off. But um, and honestly, yeah, it depends on the show and the role. Sometimes it is kind of confusing, especially um, when I write. <laughs> I end up putting a lot in the uh, writer's notes column, timing different than Jay. Like if it's off screen, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work to keep the, um, I guess the the timing of the Japanese. So. Um, when, in situations like that, I, I turn it off so that I can just like see what's before me, see where they, the writer's mark to pause is, and just do it that way. But, um, but yeah, I liked, and sometimes the, I mean, Japanese voice actors are really good. <laughs> and um, so, and I know that like fans do compare the two, so I want to know what, what I'm being compared to. You know, I find it helpful. So, but you know, to each his own. What upcoming projects do you have uh, that you can actually tell us about? Well, it's funny that you ask that. Um, I just, not just, but I recorded something in January that's coming out May 30th. You can already pre-order it on uh, sentaifilmworks.com. Um, it's called Himoto Umaru-chan, and I think it's the greatest thing I have ever done. Stage, screen, anime, all of it. Like, I'm obsessed with it. It was... This character, I don't know if you guys are familiar, she is insane. It's like, she basically has three different personalities. There's her public persona, which is like the perfect, beautiful anime girl, and then, um, high school girl. And then at home, she's like this potato chip eating, soda guzzling, <laughs> gaming, internet obsessed freak. And like, 
I am in love with her. Um, and so it was, um, Kyle Jones directed it and Ricardo Contreras was the um, engineer. And we had so much fun. I mean, like we were writing jokes on the fly and like just ad-libbing all over the place. There's a scene in which, um, two scenes I'm gonna talk about. There's one in which Umaru gets sick and there's this whole like, dream sequence, like fever dream sequence, where she battles all of the viruses, like all of the different incarnations of the virus, and they're all her. So basically I had to, I recorded the initial pass with the main Maru, and then um, went back and, and Kyle would be like, okay, now you're this one right there. And I would record her track and then go back. Now you're this one and record her track. And like, it probably took like an hour to record a three minute sequence, um, but it was insane. And then there's another scene, I forget the context, but um, it's basically like the United Nations of Umaru, and there's the regular Umaru, and then there's like a British Umaru, and a Hispanic Umaru, and then there's um, like a, a, a shy Umaru. I mean, there are 10 of them, and like they're all debating snacks, I think. Um, so it was insane. And Did you use different accents? Oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I, I spoke in Spanish, too. Oh, cool. um, right. I can't wait for it to. Um, I can't wait for people to see it. It's some people have already seen it because they pre-ordered, but I got my copy right before I left, and I have it with me. And my room doesn't have a DVD player, unfortunately, but um, I might track one down. <laughs> I can't wait to see how it turned. Out. In the beginning, you know, I got much smaller roles, and um, and it was all just going in blind and like having the director tell you what was going on moment to moment. But now I, I actually I watch the subs. Um, and try to get a feel for the character. I do that a lot when I'm auditioning, um, and then I kind of revisit every once in a while before I go in. Um, but it's also, I don't know, it's, it's been really magical to see the industry grow and to see it almost approach kind of becoming mainstream, mm -hmm. which I have mixed feelings about that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's nice to like, I like sort of being, you know, in an obscure sort of niche, mm -hmm. but. Um, it's not a little secret anymore. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but then it's also exciting to, you know, have my little brother's friends, like, my little brother be like, oh my gosh, so-and-so is like obsessed with you. And I'm like, what, really? They know who I am? Oh my gosh. Um, so that's fun. <laughs> but um, I hope that it does continue to, to grow and reach a wider audience. Um, I really think that it will. It's, mm -hmm. It makes it awesome. So I think that I'm grateful, but I, it, at the same time, you know, it's kind of like, it used to be my right. thing. <laughs> Star's plane goes to the shell. Yeah, right? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs>